In the early 1980s, Karen Larkey was studying to be an actress. For about six months, she was working with an acting coach named Sal Romeo. Low-budget independent exploitation and horror films were raking in huge box office returns, so Karen spoke to Dan Larkey to try to capitalize on this by producing their own movie. Karen and Dan spoke about this to Romeo, who was interested in the project. At the time, both sexploitation and horror films were very popular, so they knew picking one of those genres would be their best bet at making a profit. None of them wanted to do sexploitation, so they went with horror. Karen didn't like the genre, but recognized how popular movies like Halloween and Friday the 13th were, and agreed this would be the right choice. The group discussed who they would get to direct, and Romeo had the perfect candidate. Romeo went to college with a guy named Tom Eberhardt, who was now working at KOCE Orange County, a local public TV station. He knew Eberhardt had experience as both a writer and director doing theater work, so he was sure he would be a good choice to helm the production. Romeo asked Eberhardt if he had any ideas for a horror film, and he enthusiastically said yes. Flasher films were the most popular horror subgenre at the time, but Eberhardt had little interest in making one of those. He wanted to make something more along the lines of a horror thriller. So many films were trying to copy the Halloween formula, and he wanted this film to be different. Eberhard looked into a mental condition called survivor's guilt and discovered that many people who survive a large catastrophe will often die shortly thereafter, with a good number killing themselves. The topic of survivor's guilt had previously been used in everything from a 1959 episode of The Twilight Zone to the 1980 film Ordinary People. He began writing a script about a woman who survives a plane crash, only to be haunted by agents of death who were there to collect her soul because she was supposed to die on the plane. The movie was an original idea, but did have some influences, mainly from the 1962 horror film Carnival of Souls. During this time, Karen and Dan Larkey worked together to gather the funds for the production and came up with $350,000. This was still a relatively low number, so they would need to work hard at stretching the budget as much as possible. As a way to save money, they tried to cast mostly people they knew. Since Karen was an actress, having her in the film seemed like a no-brainer. She was cast as the psychic failed actress Carla Davis. In 1978, Eberhard had seen a film called Girlfriends. In the film was Anita Skinner, a young actress who was nominated for a Golden Globe for the film. He loved her performance and insisted they hire her for the lead role of Denise Watson. She was the only person cast that the producers didn't know. For the part of Dr. Richardson, they hired actor Kurt Johnson. For the rest of the cast, they hired friends, students, acquaintances, essentially anyone they could bring in on the cheap. Romeo hired a bunch of his students as extras. They hired a young Brink Stevens for a small role because she was the only one willing to do a nude scene. As for the crew, they hired mostly people who had worked with Eberhardt in the past, either in TV or on his short films. They started filming in November of 1982. This was Eberhardt's first time directing a feature-length film, and he went all in. He was very meticulous about shooting and insisted on having the final say on everything. He made it clear early on he was doing things his way. Rumor had it he even banned some of the producers from being on the set. This was both good and bad. While it allowed Eberhardt to have his creative freedom, it created a very tense set. Emotions were running high and there was friction between the director, the cast, and the crew. While many of the crew worked with the director in the past, the cast was new to this and some of them handled it better than others. To save money on locations, they contacted as many people as they could and were able to get the okay to shoot in people's houses, apartments, and so on. Eberhardt was still working at KOCE TV at the time, so he was able to get the okay to film some scenes in the off hours at the studio. One of the producers was friends with a pilot who was able to get them some time to film in the air control tower at the Orange County Airport. They needed some exterior locations for either cheap or free and struck gold with Santa Ana, California. In the downtown area, no one ever filmed there, so they were allowed to film there for free in the hopes that word of mouth would attract a larger production in the future. The Tustin Medical Center just received new equipment, so they let them film it for free simply because they wanted to have a way to show it off. The hospital had a floor that wasn't in use and allowed them to film there. They did as much as they could to save money on the little things in the production so they could put the funds towards the big things, like being able to shoot the film in 35mm. For another example, in many productions they'd rent a car, but in this, they just used the directors. Eberhardt wanted the film to be heavy on atmosphere rather than jump scares. This was a way to make it scary and also to save money by having limited special effects. There were some makeup effects, but they were used sparingly. In the park scene, Karen's son and his friends are the ones playing football in the background. Dan Larkey has a cameo as the guy in the elevator. Early on, we see the subtle specter of death and the reflection of the glass in the air traffic control monitor. They liked this so much they used it for the poster. They took a big gamble and shot the entire film without permits. Luckily, since they had permission from most of the places they were shooting, they got away with it. The film wrapped after about 26 days with a few additional days for pickup shots. 
When it was over, everyone was exhausted. The daily shoots were long and the tension on set made them seem longer. Wanting full control over the film, Eberhardt also edited the production. They had a screening and everyone involved was very happy with the final result. Now with the film finished, they need to find a distributor. Dan Larkey took the print and shopped it around to potential studios. Since it was shot in 35mm, a lot of studios that otherwise wouldn't have been interested wanted to see it. Back then, as a way to save money, many lower-budgeted films would shoot in 16mm and then have the footage blown up to 35mm for the theatrical release. Since they shot Soul Survivor in 35mm, it added a layer of legitimacy to it, regardless of the budget. After searching for a distributor, they decided to go with International Film Marketing, or IFM. IFM offered them money up front as well as a cut of the theatrical profits, which seemed like the best deal. IFM assured them they'd make a lot of money if the film caught on and was a hit. The movie was submitted for a rating, and it came back with an R, which is what they were hoping for. Back then, an R-rated horror film was what you wanted if you were looking to make a profit. While the film wasn't particularly violent, it did have some intentional nudity and language to ensure they'd get the rating. The producer spoke to the distributor and insisted the film be sent to theaters as it was, and not to be edited. Unfortunately, the distributor ignored their requests. Also unfortunate was that since they were new to this end of the business, they didn't put anything in the contract, so the distributor was well within their rights to make the changes. IFM re-edited the film and cut out about three or four minutes, which upset the filmmakers, but they couldn't do anything about it. While it didn't ruin the film, it removed some of the dark humor and took the punch out of some of the more dramatic scenes. The edited version of the film was released in the theaters on January 27th, 1984, and was a modest hit. The producers were excited because they were expecting a cut of the profits. However, after the reports came in, that quickly turned to disappointment. Every quarter, the numbers came back, and even though the film had been pulling in millions, the balance always seemed to show that with the marketing and other costs, that the film was mysteriously always in the red by a few hundred dollars. On paper, it meant that the film never made a profit, and therefore, there was nothing to give the creators. The distributor also controlled the home video rights, so the creators didn't make any money on that end either. Anita Skinner decided this nonsense wasn't for her and left the industry, moving back to the Midwest where she came from. Two years after the film was released, Kurt Johnson died suddenly in 1986. He was only 33 years old. Frank Stevens would go on to make over 190 films and is one of the genre's most beloved scream queens. Karen Larkey never produced another film. She continued acting, mostly in TV, short films, and theater, and recently appeared in the smash hit Get Out. The cinematographer was Russell Carpenter, and this was his first feature-length film. He since worked on Hard Target, The Lawnmower Man, and then started working with James Cameron on True Lies and Titanic. Recently, he was the DOP on Ant-Man, and is working with Cameron again on both Avatar 2 and 3. Tom Eberhardt followed Soul Survivor up with Night of the Comet, which was a minor theatrical success, but has gone on to be a major cult favorite. That brings me to Final Destination. Soul Survivor and Final Destination do share some things in common. On top of the obvious that they both revolve around the survivor of a plane crash, the other is what almost kills Denise the first time after that. Denise almost gets crushed by a driverless truck at a loading bay. This is what ended up being the basis for Final Destination. Everyone who survived the plane crash was later killed by some odd accident. With Soul Survivor though, this is the only time it happens. The rest of the deaths in the film are done directly by the recently deceased coming back as a sort of zombies to murder anyone who has come into contact with Denise. They do a good job of explaining death's motives early on, which is pretty much the same thing in Final Destination. Well, you keep it in mind that what happened was just luck, pure and simple. I mean, don't make anything more out of it. It's just like that dress you never got billed for. Oh, I got billed for it, all right. Those stupid computers. They may make a mistake, but they eventually find you. So in essence, death has made a mistake, and once it realized this, it's out to fix that mistake because you can't cheat death. In Soul Survivor, there's Carla the Psychic who tells Denise that death is coming for her. In Final Destination, Bloodworth the Mortician tells Alex that death is coming for him. Carla had a vision of the crash before it happened. Alex had a vision of the crash before it happened. Both films also end on a cliffhanger down ending. I'm not calling Final Destination a rip-off of Soul Survivor, because aside from the similarities, they do both tell different stories with the same basic concept at the core. I think Morgan and Wong were perhaps inspired by Soul Survivor, in the same way Soul Survivor was inspired by Carnival of Souls. Carnival of Souls is about a woman who survives a traumatic car wreck and is mysteriously drawn to an abandoned carnival. While trying to get there, she's haunted by a group of pale-faced people. Carnival of Souls was loosely remade in 1998 as Wes Craven's Carnival of Souls, where about the only thing it shared with the original was the ending. 
In 2001, it was loosely remade again as Soul Survivors. In 2007, it was loosely remade yet again as Yella. Soul Survivor is an outstanding little horror thriller. The atmosphere in the film is foreboding and gets more uncomfortable as the film goes on. Eberhardt did a great job with his first feature, but I can understand why more people know him from Night of the Comet. It's just more of a crowd pleaser. The plane crash scene is handled perfectly. With the small budget, there was no way they could have done it as an effect, even with miniatures. So they just showed some stock footage of a plane, and then implied the crash with the air traffic control tower. Then they showed the aftermath, with bodies and body parts littering the ground. The camera moves over to Denise, who's sitting in her chair, stunned and unharmed. It's a brilliant way to show something without showing it. Anita Skinner is terrific in the film. She's both tough and vulnerable. It's a shame she quit acting, but with all the nonsense the film went through, you can kind of understand why more than a few that worked on it decided to distance themselves from the industry. Soul Survivor's terrific, but the slow pace could put off some people. It doesn't rush into things, and doesn't over-explain the plot either. It has a bit of love story as well, which is important because it makes the character's demise all the more tragic. The movie had guts, killing off pretty much the entire cast. The film was restored for DVD and Blu-ray, but sadly, the footage IFM cut was lost, and the restored release is the same cut the distributors made. Even in its cut form, the film still shines. It's just unfortunate we'll never see the original version. If you like the original Final Destination and Carnival of Souls, you really should check out Soul Survivor. It's not as gory as Final Destination, and not as weird as Carnival of Souls, but it fits somewhere comfortably in between. <laughs> Come on, Jennifer. We can't expect Randy to go through with it if we're not willing to, right? All right, but I hope it's worth it. It is.